Greetings, brethren, and welcome to our presentation on the history of God's storehouse. We'll be looking at this from a broad perspective, looking at the storehouse history from Genesis all the way to Revelation, as revealed through the Shepherd's Rod message. In this way, we can gain an understanding of the basis how to decide where God's storehouse is in the present day. So we'll be breaking this down into six sections. Section one, we will look from Adam up to the reformers. Section two, we'll focus on the sixth and the ninth hour calls. Section three, we will look at the work of Old Mount Carmel Center under the direction of Brother Haddaf. Section five, we will look at the scattering period after the death of Brother Haddaf in 1955, up to our present day. Section 5, we will look at the efforts of remodeling the rod that have happened since Brother Haddaf died. And finally, in Section 6, we'll address one of the more controversial issues in Davidia. The question is, is Waco, Texas, the storehouse location today? So with this in mind, let us consider the following text for prayer, and it comes from a passage in Acts of Apostles, page 99, and it reads, When Stephen was questioned as to the truth of the charges against him, he began his defense in a clear, thrilling voice, which rang through the council hall. In words that held the assembly spellbound, he proceeded to rehearse the history of the chosen people of God. He showed a thorough knowledge of the Jewish economy and the spiritual interpretation of it now made manifest through Christ. He repeated the words of Moses that foretold of the Messiah, A prophet shall the Lord your God rise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. He made plain his own loyalty to God and to the Jewish faith while he showed that the law in which the Jews trusted for salvation had not been able to save Israel from idolatry. He connected Jesus Christ with all the Jewish history. He referred to the building of the temple by Solomon and to the words of both Solomon and Isaiah. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? So here we're told the importance of recounting our history and how God has led his people in ages past. And in this way, we can better understand how God is leading his people today. With this in mind, let us kneel in prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit to guide, lead, and direct us in our study. Our Father, which art in heaven, blessed be thy name. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son, Christ Jesus, to shed his blood on the cross of Calvary and to save us from our sins. We thank you for the privilege to call upon your name, and we invite the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in our midst, to guide, lead, and direct us as we do this investigation of our history as a people, the history of your preserving the truth through the storehouse, that we can understand where the storehouse is today. And for this privilege, we thank you when we ask it in the worthy name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. So, in section one, here's our overview, and we're going to see how the truth was steadfastly preserved through faithful servants, and we'll be highlighting key figures, starting with Adam and Eve, and how Abel's true sacrificial offering was accepted of God. Next, Enoch, who prophesied of Christ's second coming. We'll look at Noah, who preserves one generation in the ark. And then Abraham, who by faith heeds God's commands. And then Moses, who preserved the law and the moving sanctuary. 
Next, we'll look at Joseph, who preserved the seed of Israel. And then King Hezekiah, who restored true worship in Israel. And then the Apostolic Church, that was compelled to start a new storehouse in the New Testament. And finally, we'll look at the Reformers, who upheld the truth through the Dark Ages. So this is our outline, where we're going to break this down. So we're going to look into each part in more detail. Of course, our guide will be the 11th hour chart. This inspired chart reveals two periods of prophetic history. Here's the chart at the 11th hour. Now we commonly teach on the upper half, the calls that began in the morning, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth and 11th hour calls. That we're familiar with, but there's also the underside, the period during the moon, in which we will use as a guideline for our study in this presentation. So beginning with Adam at the third hour, Enoch at the sixth hour, and Noah at the ninth hour in the period of the moon. So let us begin. And it all began in the Garden of Eden, the first home of our parents. Although today man faintly attempts to reproduce this Eden paradise ever so faintly, compared to the original, but we do have a description and inspiration here in this passage in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46 and 47, it reads, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Everything that God had made was the perfection of beauty, and nothing seemed wanting. In this garden were trees of great variety, many of them laden with fragrant and delicious fruit. There were lovely vines, presenting a most graceful appearance with their branches drooping under the load of tempting fruit of the richest and most varied hues. Mind cannot really compare, I have not seen, the beauty that was lost in Eden. Adam and Eve's disobedience resulted in Eden's loss, and they were cast out of Eden. And this is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 and 24. It reads, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So in this fall, due to sin, God instructed Adam and Eve. He prepared for them coats of skins and clothed them and communicated to them the gospel, which in turn they were to pass on to their offspring, their children. And so we hear the, see the story of Abel, whose true sacrificial offering was accepted by God, in contrast to his brother Abel. And this story is recorded in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. It reads, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. So here we see that Abel obeyed the Lord's instructions, whereas Cain brought the offering of his own making. And Hebrews 11.4 records, And by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So one offering accepted of God, the other one was not. So this created jealousy that in Cain, and it costed Abel's blood. And we have on record the first murder in the Bible. Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, page 246, explains the significance of this. 
It reads, Since all who had a message of truth had to suffer persecution in ages past, it must be expected now. The enemy of all righteousness by the human tool in the garb of religion has opposed God's truth in every step of the way. The death of Abel by the cruel hands of his brother Cain was a signal to all followers of truth that persecution was to arise against them by their own brothers in the church. Thus, it has been up to our own day. How true! So we can certainly expect the day that our greatest trouble will be those from within. Ellen White counsels us that we have more to fear within than to fear without. Next, we have Enoch, who prophesied of judgment in the second coming. Of course, Enoch was one of two people that were translated in the Old Testament. And his message is recorded here in Jude, verses 14 and 15. It reads, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that they are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here's the message at the sixth hour, Enoch prophesying of judgment in the second coming. Next, at the ninth hour, Noah preached the message in one generation. Of course, as Noah built the ark, he preached for 120 years. And this is told here in Hebrews 11, verse 7. It reads, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and become heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And in Second Peter 2, verse 5, it reads, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we see here, God is not interested in quantity, but quality. And only eight were saved from this worldwide catastrophic flood. And just as Noah was called a preacher of righteousness, we too today are called to be preachers of righteousness. After God delivered Noah and his family in the ark, Noah built an altar of sacrifice after the flood. Here's an illustration from a famous German illustrator, Julia Schor von Karelsfeld, to depict this event. This illustrator also, Brother Haddaf, used an illustration of his on one of the rod track literatures. If you want to think about which one, it's an interesting puzzle. This record is found in Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 and it reads, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Acceptable worship to God for his deliverance. Next we have Abraham, who by faith offered Isaac, his own son, as a sacrifice. Here's a beautiful Renaissance-era painting depicting this scene. And the scriptures tell a story in Genesis 22, verses 2 and 3. It reads, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. So Abraham is considered the father of the faithful because he obeyed God's command without question. Also, Abraham is the first record we have in the Bible of returning tithes. So Abraham gave a tenth. Here's a a beautiful painting showing that, and he returned this to Mechizeldak, king of Salem. And this is told in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. It reads, For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. 
to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. So here we have a record of Abraham returning a tithe, a tenth, to the storehouse in that day. Well, Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob, and the sons of Jacob, Joseph, was the one who God used to preserve the seed of Israel. And this is told in Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, page 106. An analogy here. As Joseph gathered the corn in the seven years of plenty into the storehouses to feed the world in the seven years of famine, just so Christ gathered the word of God in the Old Testament time into the great storehouse, the Bible, to feed the world in the New Testament time. As this picture shows here, this is in China, Here's a storehouse full of corn, kept much the way as it was by Joseph many centuries before. So the corn here being a symbol of God's truth. Next we have Moses who sustained the truth in the moving sanctuary. Of course, God gave Moses a vision of the sanctuary in heaven and told him as a pattern, and told him to go make a tabernacle on earth that he may dwell amongst men. And we're told here in great controversy in the prefects a timetable of this, how the truth was preserved. It reads, during the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. The preparation of the written word began in the time of Moses. Inspired revelations were then embodied in an inspired book. This work continued during the long period of 1600 years from Moses, the historian of creation and the law, to John, the recorder of the most sublime truths of the gospel. So here we see that the truth was preserved for the first 2500 years of earth history by oral tradition word of mouth, if you will. But then later, God rose up Moses to begin a written record of preserving the truth. And that continued for 1,600 years, 66 books of the Bible, 44 authors, ending with John. Moses also instituted the service of the Levites. Here's a picture of Moses anointing his elder brother Aaron into the priesthood. And this is recorded in Exodus chapter 38, verse 21. It reads, This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony, as it was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. And in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 30, it reads, And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. So here we see the institution of the Levitical priesthood as an important part of preserving the truth and ministering to God's word to the people. We find that scribes were an important part of preserving the scriptures. Here's a picture of a scribe in the modern era, in 1940s, transcribing much in the same way it's been done for centuries, on scrolls of parchment paper by hand, a very time-consuming and tedious process. We also see that Levites were the scribes, and Ezra himself was a scribe and a Levite. And we read here in Ezra chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. 
Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. In Matthew 13, verse 32, And he said unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Next, we find that the truth was preserved in Solomon building the temple, and this is a type of the storehouse to come. This rather magnificent structure uh, was built and involved the service of the Levites and the whole ceremonial system. And this is told in Hebrews 7, verse 5, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So we see here that the Levites took the tithes of the people, not only to build the temple, but also to preserve its ordinances and services. Next we have Elijah, who offered a true offering on Mount Carmel. Of course, we know that there was a showdown between the prophet of God and the prophets of Baal. And this is told in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 31 and 36. It reads, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. And of course God consumed the acceptable sacrifice of Elijah and all the prophets of Baal were destroyed. And we're told that there will be an antitypical showdown at Mount Carmel between the prophet of God and the prophets of Baal in our day. And this is told in Timely Greetings, Volume 2, Number 41. If you would like to read more into that, we encourage you to do so. Next, we have King Hezekiah, who restored proper worship and tithing after Israel had fallen into idolatry. Hezekiah was one of the good kings in the two-tribe kingdom. And here's a 14th century painting depicting Hezekiah. And here's the record in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verses 5, 9, and 10. It reads, And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in an abundance of the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field. And the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have left plenty, for the Lord has blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. Remarkable what a revival and reformation there was to rebuild the, uh, preserve the temple and the services therein. What a contrast to today. Do we see an excess in the storehouse? Well, after Judah was brought into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, God rose up the prophet Nehemiah to rebuild the temple, the second temple. Now, Nehemiah was not only a Levite, but he was or a prophet of God, but he was an architect and an engineer and was instrumental in the rebuilding of the second temple. And that's told here in Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 37 and 39. It reads, And that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and of oil unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites. And the same Levites might have the tithes of all the cities of our tillage, for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine, and the oil unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters, and the singers. And we will not forsake the house of our God. 
So in restoring the temple, the Levites were instrumental, and the tithes were used to rebuild this temple and to support the Levites. Another important point here is that in rebuilding the temple, Nehemiah refused to allow Gentiles to have a part. Only the Levites were involved in this rebuilding of the temple. And that's an important lesson for us today as we strive to rebuild and restore the truth in the rod. Should we involve the Gentiles of the world? No, it should be God's people that are involved in restoring the truth of his word. Finally, we have in the Old Testament Malachi instructing that the tithe should be returned to the storehouse. Of course, in those days, most of people's increase was from agricultural pursuits. So they brought grains and the fruits of their field to the storehouse. And Malachi promises here in a familiar verse, chapter 3, verse 10, it reads, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. This scripture is poorly understood among us, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, where to return our tithes. So let's look at more carefully these three words highlighted there in red. The rod itself defines the storehouse. Here's a picture of what's called a tithe barn. These were built in England in the 14th to 15th centuries. And literally, the people in their agricultural pursuits brought a tenth or the tithe And it was kept in these barns right next to the church. And that's where the priest or the ministers lived off of the increase or the tithe. In Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, pages 15 and 18, it reads, When the perplexing subject is made clear, then we must believe that the time is here. But this, as all Bible truth, is found only one way and in one place, namely the storehouse, the Bible. Bear in mind that as Joseph of ancient days controlled the storehouse, even so Christ controls the scriptures and the times. As Joseph gathered the corn into storehouses by his servants, the Egyptians, just so Christ gathered the word of God, spiritual food, in the Bible, the storehouse, by his servants, the prophets. So we see here how the truth is preserved through Christ and his prophets bringing the truth and compiling it into the Holy Bible. Now let's define these terms in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It comes from the Bible. We're going to look at the symbol, its definition, and the references. The first symbol, the house. What is the house? Well, the Bible tells us that's the church. And here are the references, Matthew 10 verse 25 and Isaiah 56 verse 7 where we're told that the house of God is a house of prayer for all nations all people next the meat what is the meat the meat is the word the spiritual food that God desires for us to nourish on and the references here Matthew 24 verse 45 the meat in due season also John 4 verse 24 and Chapter 6, verse 27. Next, the storehouse. Well, this is the place where the truth is stored. And the references here, Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 10 through 14, and Luke chapter 12, verse 24. And finally, we have in due season. This represents a timely truth, a message of timely truth, or present truth. And this is defined in Great Controversy, page 609, and Desire of Ages, page 634. So it's important to recognize that the tithe does not go to the church or the general conference. It goes to the place where the present truth is stored and published. And there, from there, in turn, is taken to the church, the meat, the spiritual food that the people need. Now, Christ himself acknowledged the widow's two mites, and she singly honored out 
for her faithfulness. Of course, here she is taking all that she had to put it into the treasury at that time. Of course, this was the Jewish church, and it was an apostasy, but the time hadn't come to move the storehouse. We'll find out here shortly what and when it moved. Of course, this is recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, it reads, And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. So here's a remarkable example. And we're going to see here shortly when the storehouse moves. At this time, John the Baptist, God rose him up to bear a message, and his faithful reproof of sin costed him his own head. Here's an artist's depiction of his head. And it reads here the reason why in Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. Of course, we know that Herod was seduced or, or fooled by the daughter of Herodias and ended up having John's head removed for her sake. So the faithful reproof of sin cost his life. Are we willing? Do we have this courage today to call sin by its right name? Well, we know that the blood of Christ, Jesus, preserves lives. This is the ultimate sacrifice. For without Christ, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood for the sins of the whole world, there would be no truth. So this is the cornerstone of all truth. And this is recorded in Matthew 27, verse 35 to 38. It reads, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set over his head the, his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were the two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and, and the other on the left. Well, as a result of the Jewish leaders conspiring to murder the Son of God himself, the storehouse had to move. So after the cross, the storehouse transferred. And the Apostle Paul records this, or acknowledges this, in his letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14, it reads, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it reads, he wrote, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So, of course, at this time, they no longer return the tithes to the synagogue, but brought them to the feet of the apostles, the New Testament Christians. And in turn, the apostles distributed it to the workers worthy of their hire, such as young Timothy. The disciples also paid with their lives to sustain the gospel. Every step of the way, sacrifice is required. Some were beheaded. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. Stephen was stoned. As we move into the New Testament era, we'll use the chart on the grains of Ezekiel 4. 
which gives us step by step the advancement of the Reformation and how God preserved the truth in the storehouse in the hands of the Reformers. Here's a rendition of this chart based on the original. This was done by Eukaipa in the 1970s. Well, after the cross, the Apostle Paul prophesied in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that there be a falling away, that the truth would be trodden underfoot for this period of 1260 years of papal power. And in the midst of that, God rose up the Reformation, starting around 1500, with Luther, and then step by step preserved the truth through the Reformers, Luther, Knox, Wesley, Campbell, Miller, White, and all of these truths and fundamental doctrines of our Protestant faith are gathered into one vessel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So this is how God preserved the truth during, the, during that period of time, from the Dark Ages up to the present. So we find here that the truth is preserved by small groups of people, oftentimes just a few people, who walked up the narrow path and stood strong for the truth, against great persecution. So let's summarize some of those important groups that we have much to be grateful for. We'll look at the group, the place where they were living, and the era, the time frame. Well, the first group is the St. Thomas Christians. And they were in India, and they arose in the first century up through the 17th century. And they likely came from the work of the Apostle Thomas, who traveled in that direction. And they preserved much of the manuscripts that became the basis of the King James Bible. Next, we have the Celtic Christians, who arose in Ireland and England from the 5th to the 9th centuries. And there's record that they preserved the truth of the Sabbath, along with important manuscripts. And then we have the Waldensians, who we're familiar with, because they're discussed in the Great Controversy. They lived literally right under the seat of Rome in the Piedmont Valleys of Italy from the 12th to the 17th century. And they preserved the truth at the peril of their own life to share a scripture or on pieces of paper and were brutally persecuted by the papists. And then finally we have the French, the Huguenots, who were from France, they were Protestants that were viciously persecuted by the, by the Catholic Church in the 16th through 18th centuries. Of course, that infamous St. Bartholomew massacre, where over 50,000 were, were brutally murdered in one night, and the streets of Paris ran with blood. So we're, we have much to be grateful for these faithful groups who preserved the truth at the peril of their own life. So the martyr's blood watered the truth that sowed the seeds of the gospel. Whether they be dragged out of dungeons and fed to the lions, as shown in this image, or burned at the stake as martyrs, as faithfully recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Literally millions throughout the centuries. And we have much to be grateful for them and their sacrifice to preserve the truth. Well, there arose illuminators through the Dark Ages. This man, John Wycliffe, sometimes known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, and John Huss, the preacher from Prague, Czechoslovakia, who began to protest against the heirs of the papacy. They set the foundation for the Protestant Reformation. And we see here that the storehouse transferred to the Reformers. Here's the Reformation wall in Geneva, Switzerland, and we have here Farrell and Calvin and Basil and Knox, all in this depicted in this statue. They all had important parts of the Reformation. And this is told in tract number four, page 64. It said, Later, God again transferred his storehouse, entrusting its good to the Reformers, who were stirred by the spirit of the downtrodden truth. Accordingly, his new and faithful stewards were appointed to care for the candlestick church from then on. So we see here that the storehouse moves when the existing church falls into deep apostasy. God raises up new people that will stand for the truth. 
and therefore the storehouse moves. So let's look at each one of these reformers because we have much to owe to their legacy. Martin Luther was born in 1483 and lived to 1546. And here's some highlights in his life. He was born in 1483 in Esselbahn, Germany and baptized Catholic. He entered the University of Erfurt in 1501. This is about the time that the Holy Spirit moved upon him and he began to pursue religious interests. And God was calling him to do a great work. Later, he nailed 95 theses on the door of the All Saints Church in 1517. And this infamous event started, shook Europe, and began the Reformation. He was later excommunicated by the Pope in 1520. And then he ap appeared before the Diet of Worms in 1521, an august assembly of nobles and kings and prelates, where he made this infamous proclamation, unless I am convinced by scripture in plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have all contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. So he concluded his defense of his writings, protesting against papal falsehoods and errors, and defending the authority of the Bible, sola scriptura, and also introduced the righteousness by faith, that sinners are saved by faith in Jesus alone and not in the priests. Next came John Knox, who lived from 1510 to 1572. Here's a picture of him. He was the founder of the Presbyterian denomination. He studied Reformed theology under John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, and then later moved and led the Protestant Reformation in Scotland. He introduced Presbyterian polity as a method of church government. Now, this is a very important legacy that we have much to be thankful for. The polity is the system by which God organizes his church. On the church level, it would be deacons and elders and the pastor. But then a group of local churches who had the same beliefs would come together in a local conference. And then groups of local conferences would form a union. And so you have a hierarchical structure. And this is where the Seventh-day Adventist church gets its structure, is from the Presbyterian polity that recognizing that God is a God of order and that gospel order necessitates organizational structure and interworking between churches. So this is where this legacy came from. Next we have John Wesley. He lived from 1703 to 1791. Here's a picture of him. He was an English reformer who advanced open-air lay preaching. At that time in England, it was illegal to preach unless you had a license from the state church. Of course, the Bible says otherwise, and men rose up, laymen, preachers, if you will, to preach. And many of them paid with their lives or were persecuted and beaten and imprisoned for teaching the word of God. He embraced Arminianism, and that's a heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where we recognize that God gives us free will choice, in contrast to Calvinism, which is based on predetermination. He's a co-founder of the Methodist denomination with his brother Charles Wesley, and they wrote a lot of very excellent hymns. You can find some of those in the Seventh-day Adventist hymn book. He emphasized the doctrine of Christian perfectionism, the work of sanctification of the heart by the means of God's grace. And this had a very big influence on Ellen White. She, of course, was raised as a Methodist. And in her writings, you see a heavy emphasis on character perfection and sanctification. And we owe much to the Wesleys for understanding and bringing forth this fundamental pillar of our Protestant faith. Next, we have Alexander Campbell, who lived from 1788 to 1866. Here's a picture of this gentleman. He was an Irish immigrant 
an ordained Presbyterian minister in the United States. He was a leader in the, of the Second Great Awakening religious movement in the United States. This took place con- contemporaneous with the rise of Seventh-day Adventist Church from the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. And you can look this up in history books or in, on the internet. And he was ahead of what was called the Campbellite Stone Movement around the southeastern and midwestern portions of the United States. And they had a particular emphasis of opposing infant baptism by arguing that repentance was a condition for receiving baptism. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church borrowed this understanding of adult baptism by immersion. This was a radical thing at the time, but we're thankful for this. And I believe this is the reason why God chose this man of one of the grains in Ezekiel, or identified it, because of his role of this important Protestant doctrine. So what are the summary lessons we have from this presentation? How God preserved the truth of the storehouse through the ages. Our take-home lessons, things to bear in mind as we proceed forward in our subsequent presentations. First, the storehouse is located wherever the present truth is being preached, either verbally or the printed page. Next, the storehouse accepts tithes and offerings that are used to advance the gospel message. Literally, that's what pays the Levites, the preachers, and helps support the printing or the publication of the message. Next, the Levites are supported by the tithe of the church members. Remember, the Levites of old did not have an inheritance. They were not given a portion of land. So they lived off the increase of the other tribes who brought their portion, a tenth of their increase, into the storehouse. And that's how the Levites kept the truth and supported themselves. Next, the work of scribes or publishing is an integral part of the gospel work. It's not separate of it, but it's part of it. And finally, out of necessity, God transfers the storehouse when an existing storehouse sinks into apostasy. So we see this pattern established, and we're going to see it repeated over and over as we move forward into the next sections of our presentations. At this time, we'd like to acknowledge, first and foremost, UP7.org is grateful to our kind Heavenly Father above for His enduring mercy, all-sufficient grace, and abundant blessings for the providential circumstances upon which this ministry was started. We are also most grateful to God for those open-hearted saints who have made sacrifices to support this work. This presentation and subsequent ones are the sole creation of UPA7.org, our website UPA7.org, a phone number, 860-798-3672 860-798-3672 and an email if you want to contact us upa5453 at gmail.com So we thank you for your time and attention. May God richly bless you as you search for truth on this topic of the storehouse as for hidden treasure. God bless and we look forward to you in part two of our presentation.